and welcome back to Skypothesis. Last week we shared a pure thief, this week we're making a pure assassin. Dark, murderous characters are an archetype that we spend the least amount of time with, as we feel like the Dark Brotherhood questline is best for characters that commit to it 100%. The Kingkiller is our version of a pure assassin in Skyrim. He stalks his prey, finds a stakeout position, and strikes from the shadows when the timing is perfect. Getting up close and personal with stealth kills is an extremely fun playstyle. So without further ado, let's jump into the backstory of the King Killer. In the year 188 of the Fourth Era, Wayrest was under political turmoil and under siege by Iliac Bay Corsairs. King Berenia was a coward, and when word of corruption reached his ears, he fled in secret, leaving behind a chaotic city and a frustrated ruling class trying to deal with it. Out of spite, these nobles conspired together to ensure the king never returned to the throne. They contracted with the Dark Brotherhood to hire an assassin, and they sent an Imperial veteran, who 13 years ago fought in the Battle of the Red Ring, marking the end of the Great War. This assassin never made mistakes, because he never left any variables unaccounted for. He stalked his prey, noting every habit and routine, and when the time of the knife arrived, he always executed his plans to calculated perfection. King Berenia was killed and disposed of in such effective secrecy that his fate remains a conspiracy to this day. But those involved knew the truth, and among the social circles that mattered, the Imperial veteran was given the nickname of King Killer. The secret to his longevity wasn't his ruthlessness or strength, or even his cunning, it was his motivation. Whether they admit it or not, assassins and murderers desire notoriety, and that leads them to make mistakes but the King Killer never desired that fame. He preferred to live a simple lifestyle. He enjoyed music, literature, and the simple pleasure that came from the shedding of blood. The Dark Brotherhood gave him the framework to ply his trade, and in his mind, kept him earning an honest living. When the Dark Brotherhood collapsed, he was lost. The code of the Brotherhood kept his bloodlust in check, and gave him purpose. Now, age 60, he has spent the recent decades roaming the societies of Tamriel, chasing down rumors of Brotherhood remnants, but each chapter he uncovered had already been wiped out. During his time in exile, he was able to make a living taking bounty work and the occasional contracted job with the Thieves' Guild, but it just was never the same. When he woke up on the Imperial prison cart, he knew that he had lost his edge. He was spotted and mistaken for a deserter. Sloppy work, he said to himself. Perhaps this is the end I deserve. His quick-minded feet helped him survive the dragon attack, and after fleeing, he decides to continue his search for the Dark Brotherhood in Skyrim. By the time he makes contact with Astrid, he is so relieved to find a surviving chapter that he doesn't care about the abandonment of the Code at first. He is home again, but more importantly, he is given work that allows him to kill. Once again, his work is enjoyable for him. To the Kingkiller, there is nothing more satisfying than a well-executed assassination. They don't have to be complicated or elaborate plans. He doesn't take any longer than is needed, but he does relish the jobs that require more skill and careful planning. He will tap into alchemy and though not a mage, he will occasionally use magic if the situation calls for it. We were very inspired by the book Way of Shadows by Brent Weeks. We loved how meticulous the assassins are with their profession. In one scene, Durzo Blint spends weeks harvesting the right ingredients and preparing the perfect poison to deliver via a single drop in the target's chalice during a feast. For the King Killer's playthrough, we wanted to get in the head of this type of assassin, a perfectionist who doesn't fall into that dark, shadowy, silent archetype. The King Killer approaches each contract with professionalism, so we never used the remain silent dialogue option. That just isn't his style. We also chose more utilitarian armor and weapons for the same reason. No black shadowy robes here, just functional red leather to camouflage bloodstains. The aesthetic was also chosen to mirror the assassin in that fantastic opening cutscene for The Witcher 2. While I've never played that game before, I'll never forget how impressed I was when I first saw it. Being a killer for money allows you to roleplay joining the Dawn Guard. Killing mortals who are living an ordinary life can become dull, and the King Killer thrives on challenge. Infiltrating a vampire's lair is exhilarating, and presents new challenges since they resist poison. As mentioned previously, he will tap into magic occasionally if the target requires it. Using magic as a non-mage build provided some fun challenges. He can use the power of the Thum, of course, but he can also fortify his arcane abilities with alchemy. 
he can learn the Flame Cloak spell by wandering along the coast east of Dawnstar to find the spell, and craft Fortify Magicka potions to make up the difference. This will help with all the Dawnguard fights against the undead and provide a fun challenge. The Flame Cloak spell has a base cost of 289. A single Fortify Magicka potion without any enchanted gear will add 60 Magicka if your alchemy is maxed out. We'll add another 50 with the Atronach Stone, which leaves a remaining 79 Magicka to figure out before you can cast this spell. This can be some combination of wearing Fortify Alchemy gear before crafting, or swapping out your rings and amulets for ones with a strong Fortify Magicka enchantment. It can be done and is extremely satisfying since it makes those moments feel like a unique story event, where a professional assassin's preparation has paid off. Because of how much alchemy helps this build, we do recommend building a hearthfire home and adding the greenhouse. For questlines, the Dark Brotherhood is the most important. However, we wanted to really enjoy it by taking our time and making sure we had our stealth and alchemy skills maxed out before completion. For the main quest and Dragonborn questlines, it's best not to start them until you have alchemy leveled up to the point where it's useful in taking down dragons. He does eventually complete the main quest, though not for altruistic motives or even to gain power. He just thinks to himself, fine, if nobody else will deal with these dragon attacks, I guess I will have to. He needs citizens to kill to make a living and can't do it if dragons are preventing society from functioning. For other questlines, the Thieves Guild is fine, but not the kind of work he prefers. So we did not become Guildmaster and stopped after returning the key and getting Nightingale powers. The Dawn Guard was surprisingly fun, as it provided him with the challenge he craves. I forgot that Isron literally gives you assassination quests. You have to kill disguised vampires that have infiltrated the courts across Skyrim. So that ended up being perfectly fitting for an assassin. It also forced him to think outside the box and use other alchemical solutions besides poisons, since vampires are immune. And speaking of alchemy, let's talk about the King Killer's go-to caustic creations. Unfortunately, the Fortify one-handed effect does not apply to daggers, so he will rely on back-end damage with poisons most of the time. Take full advantage of the fact that you can apply a poison on each dagger to quickly stack effects. Perhaps more than any other character we've made, this one benefits the most from getting creative with the mixtures. The possibilities are endless, but these were some of our favorites. The first we call Withering Poison, which applies a weakness to poison and ravaged stamina. This is made from Death Bell, Bleeding Crown, and Bone Meal. Combine this with other damaging poisons on the other dagger to quickly debilitate enemies. Up next is Sanguine Rot, which is a poison of slow and damage health made from Death Bell and River Betty. This is actually the most potent combination of damage health ingredients in the game, so use this poison to slow down aggressive enemies and take out massive chunks of their health after they've been hit with a weakness to poison. Finally, we have Augur's Gift, which is a Fortify Magicka and Fortify Destruction potion made from Jazbay Grapes, Nightshade, and Ectoplasm. Before he is able to cast Flame Cloak, he will need a Fortify Magicka potion. The best brew should also fortify the power of the spell he casts. This is beyond just an alchemy potion, we roleplay the Flame Cloak as an alchemical power, as he does not have the destruction skill to cast it himself. Alright, moving on to equipment. We chose to use simple and effective steel daggers. In his left hand, he wields Valder's Lucky Dagger, which has a 25% chance to critical strike, and in his right hand, he wields a Skyforge Steel Dagger. To obtain this, you could easily justify joining the companions for the sake of killing for gold. You do need work after arriving in Skyrim, and the first guild you meet are the companions. Whether or not you continue through that questline is up to you, but for our playthrough, we took our pay and dagger and noped out before becoming a werewolf. We will also carry an Imperial Bow as well for the sole purpose of delivering poisons to dragons from a safe distance. For armor, he will wear the Thieves Guild Hood, the red variant of the Dawnguard Light Armor, and the Shrouded Gauntlets and Boots. We love how the red leather comes together in this combo and felt it captured a more utilitarian vibe than just a dark shadowy assassin. Also, Letho and the Assassin of Kings had that awesome sleeveless armor, which was also a deciding factor. For stats, we leveled with an equal split between health and stamina. We are purposefully not adding to Magicka as we want to rely on alchemy whenever we use magic for the roleplay. For Standing Stones, we are using the Atronaut for that Magicka boost and 50% spell absorption. And finally, we're playing as an Imperial for the Voice of the Emperor ability. 
By the time you reach level 40, you will want the following perks. In Sneak, we are taking the entire perk tree, nothing is missing. The less you are seen, the more you can land those absurdly powerful backstabs. We are also perking the entire alchemy tree as well. Normally, we avoid at least experimenter perks here, but this character is all about using the right potion in the right situation. So learning all of the effects in-game helped in creating useful mixtures on the fly without looking them up. In one-handed, take all five in Armsman, Fighting Stance, Savage Strike, both in Dual Flurry and Dual Savagery. Finally, take Steel Smithing so you can upgrade your daggers. Fortify one-handed doesn't work on daggers, so smithing will be needed to raise their damage. However, we did not grind up this skill as self-crafted Fortify Smithing potions ended up being all we needed. If you plan to play past level 40, Illusion would be great to add to Get Quiet Casting especially if you start working in alchemy enhanced destruction spells. You can get them rolling in the shadows and even work in silent shouts as well. Light armor is a good choice as well for stamina regen. Alright, moving on to our favorite part of every build, the special moves. The King Killer's first is called Ultimatum. We are not using illusion spells, but there are other ways a Dragonborn can influence the mind. First, create a potion of Fortify Illusion with Scaly Foliota, then use one of three Illusion Replacement spells, Nightingale Strife for Fury, the Dismay Shout for Fear, and Voice of the Emperor for Calm. These are useful in situations where you are outnumbered. You have little armor and can't block so the right Illusion spell at the right time can even the playing field, and it can create some fun roleplay moments as well. Up next is Steel Cyclone. Break through the enemy's defenses with unrelenting force, then use dual wield power attacks with poison of weakness to poison on one blade and poison of ravage health on the other. Enemies are knocked to the ground and quickly lacerated with a flurry of steel. Simple but effective and always fun to pull off. Next is Immolate, which is the combination of the Augur's Gift Potion, Flame Cloak, and Invisibility Potion. Using advanced alchemical techniques, he transforms himself into a whirling tornado of fire useful for sneaking up on vampires and frying them to a crispy leaf before they know what hit them. Break invisibility with sun flare for a dramatic entrance. Finally, we have Bottled Storm, which is the Augur's Gift Potion, followed by North Wind and the Ice Form Shout. This special move was made specifically to mirror that awesome cinematic from The Witcher 2. In it, Letho pulls out an arcane vial, tosses it in the air, and unleashes an icy maelstrom that wipes out an entire deck full of soldiers. There is a perfect opportunity to reenact this at the end of the Dark Brotherhood questline. We absolutely named this Imperial Letho, by the way, and he is absolutely bald under that hood. And with those special moves completed, we are ready to wrap up the King Killer. It was a lot of fun to play a pure assassin. Though the game has aged, the stories that you tell are always fresh. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. The game is still fun to us because each moment can be an unexpected story event. We still have more builds coming, so if you like what we do, please like and subscribe to keep the magic of Skyrim alive. We'll see you next time, right here on Skypothesis.